Hey there, good morning. This is Pastor Dan with First Alliance Church. It's good to be with you. We have just a couple minutes before my dogs come in and who knows what's going to happen then. I want us today to focus just a couple of minutes on our Lenten journey. We have been talking about lamenting. And Lent and lamenting are different words, but they have a lot of the same similarities. Lent is understanding and remembering that we're but dust, and lamenting is expressing our complaint with faith that our dustiness comes with pain and suffering and struggle and challenge. So John Cavallari and I this year are going through a, a book. Well, he's going through a little bit more, but I'm reading this book, Preparing for Easter by C.S. Lewis. And this past Monday, there was a, a title called Longing for Heaven. And I thought, well, that really matches up with our idea of Lent and lament. The scripture that he highlighted came out of 1 Corinthians 1 that says, verse 20, Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Wisdom and foolishness in God's perspective. Here on page 58, Lewis writes, Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking but one of the things that a Christian is meant to do. And as we think about our idea of lamenting, one of the secrets to overcoming our sorrows is to keep our perspective right. To not only see this world as it is, but also to look forward to another world. But it's not escapism. If you'll read history, Lewis continues, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next world. The apostles themselves who set foot on the conversion of Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the straight slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were on heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become ineffective in our world. Think about that one. Because we don't think about heaven, it's harder to make sacrifices on earth for things that are eternal. Most of us find it very difficult to want heaven at all, except insofar as heaven means meeting our friends and those we love who have died. One reason for this difficulty, he writes, is that we have not been trained. Our whole education tends to fix our minds on this world. Another reason is that when the real want for heaven is present in us, we don't recognize it. That's kind of interesting. When the real want for heaven is present, we don't recognize it. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, they would know that they do want and want acutely which means very strongly, something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things that this world offers to give you, but they never quite keep their promise. All the goods that we obtain in this world eventually fade. And we know that there must be some good somewhere that doesn't fade. There must be a good somewhere that doesn't come with trouble, that doesn't have heartache. There must be some good somewhere. And that good place is heaven. 
So what do we do with this gap between the reality that there must be some good and our sense that it's too far away to think about? Well, Lewis cites three different perspectives. One is the fool's way. He calls it the fool's way on page 60. He puts the blame on things themselves. The man goes up on his life thinking that if he only tried another thing, another woman, uh, another holiday, uh, another experience, he must be, he hasn't quite found the right thing. So the fool's way is to put the blame on things. I can't find the right thing that stays with me. The second is the way of the disillusioned, sensible man. He decides that the whole system is kind of bunk, and we shouldn't really worry a whole lot about it. He becomes arrogant and thinks that his way is the only way. And he really doubts that there really is a good. It's not out there. The third way he calls the Christian way. And he says, the Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfactions for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger, and there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, and there's such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that, my friends, is the value of lament. It reminds us that we are made for another world. We are made for a, a world that's eternal. And God invites us to journey with him toward that world. I know today is a little bit long. My encouragement today as you embark on your lament of journey is that you wouldn't become cynical. You wouldn't set your mind on just things on this earth. But you will remember that those cravings for relief and those desires for things that are good are to be met in the God who loves you, the God who's made you, the God who's given you good gifts that are only for this world, but are reflections of great gifts that will come to you in heaven, the world to come. May your lament be sweet because the joy of the Lord is great. May he fill you with hope today. This is Pastor Dan, First Alliance, on our journey of lament during Lent. God bless.